My computer says it's 11.05, so we will begin this lecture on time, exactly. Um, and um, we didn't really finish with the Roman colonial city, so I want to go back and sort of hit these major points. The um, difference between, again, the Greek, in the Greek mind, the people are the city. That, that means the people, the city comes from the people. So the people are prior to the city. In the Roman mind, there were no Romans until there was a city called Rome, and as such, then, the city is prior to the people, right? So the inaugural ceremonies were actually carried out prior to inhabitation. Now, if it was a city that already existed in some form, it could be re-inaugurated via the ritual of town founding. And when it was re-inaugurated, it was re-inaugurated then as a Roman city. We saw the example of Poseidonia being converted to the Roman city of Paestum, and the inhabitants were magically converted into Romans uh, at that moment in time. And I think that had a lot to do with their success and the fact that they built these hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of cities, all according to this template, all according to this pattern that consisted of a sort of framework, a public framework, collective framework, that was held sacred. And that included the red line that you see on this map here, the boundary of the sacred part of the city, which was called the Pomerium, the area inside the pomerium uh, was called the domus, or home. And the area outside of the pomerium was called the militia, where our word military comes from. Now, the, the, once the mundus had been dug somewhere, this crossing point um, of the north-south, east-west lines within the um, within the map of the Roman heavens, uh, this crossing point was called the decussis, D-E-C-U-S-S-I-S. -S -S. And there the mundus was dug, the locks of hair, the dirt from the inhabitants' homeland, first fruits and other good things, according to Varro, the Roman writer, were promiscuously mixed and the hole was sealed. Um, then the site of the Capitolium and the Forum, which were really a unit, uh, the Forum being from that ancient Indo-European root word that our word before, for, F-O-R-E, in front of, like a foreword, um, is a space in front of the house of the triad of the Roman gods. These were not gods that you worshipped uh, congregationally. They were more like saluting the flag or playing the national anthem before a football game, something like that, right? They were sort of gods of state. Every town, in fact, every family had their own gods, and so there was a sort of polyglot of religions. And again, I think this had something to do with the fact that as a Roman citizen, you could carry dual identity. You could actually be Jewish and Roman. You could be Arabic and Roman. You could be a Gentile and Roman, right, at the same time. Um, and that's different. That is very, very different than what came uh, before it. So once these fundamental elements of the constitutional order were laid out, um, other institutional public buildings, the basilica, the law court, um, the Curia, which was uh, where the Roman Senate met, but in the case of a colony, it would be where the town council met. Um, the market buildings, if it was important or significant enough, such as at Pompeii, you would have then a guild that might occupy that. And that's what we see when we look at Pompeii, a city that actually began as a Bronze Age city, was then basically converted into a Greek city during that period of Greek colonization in southern Italy. Uh, and then after the so-called Samnite Wars, fairly late in the first century, late republic, first century B.C., uh, it was re-inaugurated as a Roman city. And these Roman institutions, like at Posidonia, like at Paestum, were actually inserted within the fabric of the existing city. So if you sort of study this a little bit, 
not much, but a little bit, you can see exactly how this worked with the Cardo and Decumana slicing through north, south, east, west, with the existing Greek sanctuary of Apollo that we see here at number three, the basilica at number one, number 15, and actually number 14 is the Curia, uh, the Capitolium and Forum, number seven. And then we notice buildings that are aligned um, having market functions, number nine, the meat market, Machellum, number seven, um, the Olatorium, or the vegetable market, and then the shrine of the Augustales, the shrine of the Lares, the gods of the local town, and then this big building, number 12, which was a guild. Um, the guilds were very, very important in the Roman world, and, uh, but it is unusual that you would have such a large building adjacent to uh, the forum, opening up right off the forum. This guild was the guild of the wool merchants, and it was given by a woman, a very wealthy woman named Eumachia. I'll also mention that unlike the Agora, where women were excluded, women were included. So women could own property, they could will property, they could divorce their husbands. Uh, they had a lot of, of, of rights as a citizen, but they could not vote and they could not hold public office. I'll also mention as a side note or a footnote, interestingly enough, Roman magistrates did not draw a salary. That's an interesting concept. <laughs> they, they weren't paid. So consuls, the magistrates, they did it because of influence. Um, now, for the purposes of this course, um, there's a classification, a kind of hierarchy of these Roman colonial cities. At the highest rung of the ladder is the colonia. These are official Roman colonies. These are cities that are established by Rome as a colony, right? And they were full citizens. Um, it could be derived from a military encampment. It could be derived from another one, but once it was inaugurated, as a colonia, it was in fact uh, a full Roman uh, colony formed by the Roman state, by Senate decree and later by imperial edict. Um, they were self-administered, but um, they were subject, of course, to Roman law. Um, they could usually had a province uh, that they were the sort of head of. Now, if we think about this, and we put it in, a, it's not exactly the same, but we could make an analogy to the United States today. And that is that um, there are 50 states. Uh, each of those have their own legislature, their own governor, their own Senate, their own House of Representatives, popular assembly. Um, there are laws that you are subject to that apply only to the state of Georgia, driver's licenses, for example. Generally, those are honored uh, by all states and most foreign countries, in fact. Um, but they, there are, in fact, there are provisions in the Constitution that says that those powers that are not uh, reserved for the federal government are reserved for the states, right? And that creates then this tension that's always in the process of evolving. Likewise, within, say, the state of Georgia, we have a capital downtown. Um, the state, Georgia Tech is a state subsidized uh, institution. Um, but then we also have, say, the city of Atlanta, which is its own municipal jurisdiction with its own police force, its own school system, its own water supply, and so forth. So if you think about that kind of hi hierarchy, that is sort of how this works. So uh, each county in Georgia would have a courthouse, right? We know who grew up here in a, in a town that had a courthouse square. Say quite a few, right? So there were other towns in your county, right? But they were not the seat of the government of that county, right? And so that's kind of how you could think about this hierarchy. Next in line was the municipia. They were Roman citizens, but without voting rights. Could not vote in elections in Rome. They held a kind of client relationship to Rome, and they were, but they were responsible for uh, supplying troops. We believe London may in fact have been, Londinium may in fact have been a municipium, even though it was the most important city in Roman Britannia, the province of Britannia. The Roman capital was Eboracum, which later, because the 
Vikings didn't know how to pronounce Eberachim, it became Jorvik, which then got converted into York. All right? And uh, excavations, when, when York Minster burned in 1979, uh, they were making repairs to the cathedral there, and they went down under the crypt, and underneath the crypt they found the Viking settlement, which had been built on top of the Roman Forum. Right? Um, so Eberachim was the actual capital of government, like Baltimore may be the most important city in Maryland, but the capital is Annapolis. You follow me? It's like that. So London was the most important city in Roman Britannia, but it was not the capital. Most likely it was a municipium. Um, the Polii were cities like Athens, Greece. These were cities that were uh, Greek cities that the Romans respected, and thus they created a separate kind of category. But if you look at Athens today, archaeologically, you will see a shift or a change that occurs uh, after about 140 uh, BCE, where you begin to get, and particularly by Hadrian in the early second century uh, of the Common Era, you will see then Roman institutions inserted within uh, the fabric of the Athenian city, including a separate forum, including libraries, including all kinds of things, even though the, uh, in the polii the local um, uh, governmental authority remained intact. And then the Civitatis. Um, these were mostly in Gaul, Britannia, Germania, and Belgium, parts of Iberia, Spain. These were communities of non-citizens, but you could kind of move up the, the hierarchy. So at some point, a Civitatis could become a municipium, at some point, a municipium could then become a colonia, like Posidonia could be reinaugurated as a Roman city. And then the castra. The castra was a military camp, and a lot of historians make the mistake, including Marvin Trachtenberg, who's a very good historian, make the mistake of actually saying that all Roman cities were derived from Roman military camps. No. The form of the military camp was the same as the form of the colonia. Why? because it was inaugurated with the same rituals, the same pomerium, the same idea of the forum, the same idea of cardo decumanus, and then the insula, or the blocks of the decumani inferiore and the cardines that actually then formed the blocks of the city. And then finally, small towns and villages uh, that are referred to typically as a vicus. Uh, English is interesting in this regard because we have a lot of cities in England today that end in itch, like Greenwich. Uh, Greenwich, the ick, itch is the ick for vicus, um, or a vicar, a parish priest, for example. These often grew up as vernacular attachments to legionary fortresses or castra, but then they could petition and move up in rank to a civitatis. So there's this kind of hierarchy. Uh, a civitatis and municipia would be administratively tied to a colonia, and each would have its own territory of agricultural land around it. You might want to actually study this chart. It's the kind of thing you can make really, it's easy to make test questions out of something like that, okay? Hint, hint. Now, they not only did this in, um, in their um, cities, they did this also in the countryside, where land was then subdivided up into 100 um, units, a uh, hundred units of what were called heredia. The heredia, notice a similar root word there, hereditary. These were the hereditary land units in the Roman world, the family farms. The heredia, which was a fairly small plot of land, and there were laws against owning more than a thousand heredia, even though they were regularly violated in the late republic, and that created a lot of problems. The heredium was then further subdivided into an actus, uh, which was where you kept cattle, and a eugerum, which was where you planted crops. The eugerum um, basically was the size of two actus, or acti, and um, in fact, our word action, the same shares a root to actus. It meant to drive cattle across a field. Um, the Romans divided, in their laws, divided the world up into real property, what we call real estate, and capital, coming from the number of head of cattle that someone owned. 
The difference was that capital was movable and was transferable into another asset. It could be bought and sold, slaughtered, driven to market, traded for something else, or sold on the open market, whereas land was a hereditary thing and was considered permanent, the boundaries being somewhat sacred. In fact, they were sacred. And in this Roman system, we'll come back to this when we come to the colonial United States because our system actually developed from this, that's why I'm emphasizing it. Uh, one step was two and a half feet, Roman feet, which was 11.87 inches. Uh, one pace was five feet, a thousand paces, mile pesos, mile. Uh, this got to be a problem in the Middle Ages, and so 280 feet was added to it, but more on that later. This is a, an actual map, a property map um, of land ownership showing the hereditary units that were then conferred um, at some point after the death or bought somewhere. And, and this is actually like today. You go down to the courthouse, you look up an address, you find a deed, there's your name, my name is in there, uh, the amount of tax I paid, that sort of thing. And this is what this was. This is very, very old, uh, and it will disappear completely in the medieval world, and it will take a very, very, very long time to come back. It will not be until the 19th century and the colonial world that we will see this in full swing again. Um, this is a, just a Google Earth image that I thought I would illustrate here in the Po Valley in northern Italy uh, near the Roman town Imola, which is still there. And you can see the pattern of fields. And if you sort of, uh, you don't even have to use your imagination. You can see the orthogonal grid. And then if you sort of superimpose the heredia on top of it, what you see is that this pattern actually was laid down over 2,000 years ago. And so when you create these constitutional frames, that's why I'm emphasizing it so much, they tend to stay with us for a very, very, very long time. An example of this would be Ostia. And here what we see is a full... Roman colony. In fact, it was, according to Livy, the first colony of Rome. There's some scholarly debate about that, partly because nothing in the material record can push its date of founding back before 396, before the Common Era. Um, there may have been another Ostia on another site. We don't know, but there's certainly nothing in Ostia today that, in fact, uh, can be pushed back uh, beyond 400 BCE. But according to Livy, it was founded very early in the 7th century, about 100 years after the founding of Rome, and was built as a uh, military encampment to protect the entrance to the Tiber, where it flowed out into the Mediterranean. And thus it became the port city of Rome, like Piraeus was to Athens, a little bit further away, uh, but then it grew, and as it grew, it moved up in order and was refounded um, at some point, probably multiple times, as a colonia. Uh, most of what is there, the vast majority of it, 84% of the material that has been recovered from Ostia, dates uh, to the early part uh, of the first, second, the last part of the first and the early part of the second century. CE. That would put it in the reign of Trajan and the reign of Hadrian, about 100 to about 140 uh, CE. The land use, interestingly enough, there's, there are a lot of warehouses here, but the um, percentage of the total land that is put into streets is almost exactly the same percentage, interestingly enough, as Madison, Wisconsin, Athens, Georgia, and almost identical to Midtown Atlanta. I find that fascinating. More on that toward the end of the course. If we look, if we squint actually at this drawing, what we can see is the outline of the original pomerium with its cardo and its decumanus. And then notice that as the street moves outside, as the decumanus moves outside of the pomerium, it adjusts and it shifts continuing orthogonally to the beach. That's the reason for it. Likewise, as the city grew, 
uh, for various reasons, existing buildings that were important, uh, sacred buildings, land ownership patterns, natural features, other kinds of things that could then shift as it moved outside of the plowed pomerium. The forum at the center contained the Capitolium facing south. If we look at that in detail, we see the Cardo, Decumanus, Pomerium uh, of the original colonia still embedded within the fabric uh, of the material there, of the buildings. And then we see the Capitolium looking out over the forum. Now, that was expanded substantially, uh, again, during the period of Trajan and during the period of Hadrian. Uh, the forum was expanded substantially. The Capitolium was rebuilt. A new basilica was added, and there was actually another temple that was put down at the end that actually predates that. It goes back to the reign of Tiberius. Uh, so I have superimposed here the closest, closest I can get to the site of the Republican Forum, uh, and there you see the Decumanus Maximus and the Cardo moving through it. The rectangle that we see here is actually the excavation of the Cardo from the Republican period. So it was raised slightly. And actually, the streets were raised quite a bit there because it was subject to flood, which also allowed them to run sewer and water supply um, in these troughs that were sort of uh, running along the sidewalks next to, next to the street. This is the view from the Capitolium looking out. We have retail market functions over here facing out onto the Cardo. The Basilica is over here facing onto the Decumanus with a side entrance there into the, into the uh, forum. And it's possible, although it's very controversial, that this, this what's, half the scholars believe this was a well, the other half aren't sure. And there are a few people that say it probably was the Mundus, the location of the Mundus. Uh, there's no indication of hydraulic mortar there, so it probably was not a fountain. It's not clear what it was. But anyway, there it is. It's in the right place for the Mundus, so maybe we'll call it that. The Curia was just off the forum, facing on to the Decumanus. We see that there in the red dot. There's the Basilica. There's the temple that was built by Tiberius facing the Capitolium. And then you'll notice that there were, just outside at the gates, other important Roman deities and temples temple complexes which were constructed at the gates. This will become significant in a moment. And then if we look at land use, public buildings such as the baths, there were quite a few. Uh, this is not all of them, but it's, um, it's seven of them, including a very elaborate set of public toilets that we see as the red dot here next to number two, which is the forum baths. And there we see the public toilets up here in the upper left. Uh, the keyhole was so that you didn't have toilet paper, so you had uh, a, a stick with a sponge, and that's how you cleaned yourself. Um, it's kind of a clever design, actually. <laughs> uh, there was water that flowed permanently down through this trough, very clean water flowed in here uh, into the sewer. And then the baths themselves could be heated via a system called a hypocost, uh, which was a hollow floor built up on these tiles. Uh, that could actually then allow for um, hot air to be drawn from a furnace that we see here at A. And then that is drawn through the floor at C and B and up through shafts or chimneys that were embedded within these very thick walls, F. It took a lot of work to get that fire to draw properly. They must have had suction coming up through those pipes. I'm not sure how they did that. But once that fire was lit, they could not let it go out because it would then stop drawing and they had to go through the entire procedure again. Um, so you had hot and cold water, uh, sweat rooms, you had no soap. Uh, you scraped yourself with a device called a strigula that was designed for different parts of your body, the trunk, chest, back, shoulders, arms, legs, so forth. Uh, after being rubbed down with olive oil, you would scrape all the dirt and so forth off and you would sweat it all out and then you would wash it all out in a, it's a very elaborate ritual. The baths were open to everybody and they were public. And um, often the larger ones in Rome, there were 11 great baths in Rome, the largest, the Baths of Diocletian, covered 32 acres and could accommodate, uh, 32 acres, you imagine that, a single building, 
and included meeting rooms, restaurants, exercise yards, swimming pools, all kinds of things. These were family activities. I tend to think of them as public country clubs without the golf course, right? Sort of like that. Exercise, equipment, all kinds of things. So this is showing the forum baths at, um, at Ostia with the hypercost embedded. I like the section because you're looking in the foreground at the marble revetment and then this very thick pozzolana uh, mortar layer and then the pipes and then the structure wall, structural wall, which is, of course, uh, brick in Opus Latericium. These are the forum baths at Pompeii. Some of you have been there. Those are Georgia Tech students, by the way, from that study abroad program I mentioned. And uh, this was the caldarium. In fact, the ribs on the roof were to collect condensation so it didn't drip on you and actually move it down to the sides into a little gutter that then carried it out with a basin of cold water so that if you overheated, you could then cool yourself down. This is the Stabian baths. Um, uh, these were small and very old, and so they rotated men and women at different times. And then here, the Stabian baths had both women's facilities and men's facilities, and then private rooms. These are the latrines that we see right here at number 12, a large exercise court, and a swimming pool that the whole family could use called a tepidarium. These were supplied by water. Uh, we know more about water supply in Rome than we would ever want to know. We know the, uh, at a particular snapshot, a particular moment in time, because of all the strange things that survived, uh, you know, Varro was a huge scholar. We know that because everyone references Varro, almost like someone would say, as, to quote Shakespeare, right? Uh, people would quote Varro. But the only thing that survived of Varro is a partial etymology of the Latin language and a manual that he wrote for his wife, who was 20 years his junior, that he wrote when he was in his 80s on how to take care of the family farm. Um, amazing. The, just the randomness of what survived the Middle Ages uh, is <laughs> it's really remarkable. For some reason, who knows why, this... Um, this inventory of Roman of the Roman water supply, the water supply of Rome, by Frontinus, who was the uh, he was actually what we would call the director of public works in the reign of Trajan for the city of Rome, and like any good engineer, the first thing he did when he was appointed that position was to make an inventory of the entire water system, and so we have you know, we know the size of the apertures, right? We know the volume by aqueduct. Um, and this is actually a chart of it over here. If you do the arithmetic on this, what you will see is that Rome had something slightly less than what we have in Atlanta today uh, of potable water entering the city per person per day. About 116 gallons. I think Atlanta's about 128. What that means is when you get up in the morning to brush your teeth, you don't think about whether, where you're going to get the water. Right? When you flush your toilet, you don't think about where you're going to get the water. When you get out of class and you go over here and drink out of the water fountain, you don't even think about it, right? You just assume it's coming. And Rome was blessed with an enormous water supply. Uh, again, clean water in, dirty water out. If you don't have that, you don't have civilization. This water was distributed uh, mostly to the baths and to a variety of different uses, a lot of commercial uses, bakeries and other things that needed it. They paid for it. Uh, if you were wealthy enough, you could have it brought directly into your house. But for most of the people um, in a place like Ostia, for example, which did have an aqueduct, uh, you got your water out of public water, public drinking fountains. This is one that's on the Decumanus. And you'll notice that there was a screen here to protect it from pollution. And then... Uh, this was actually um, where you would get the water coming out of this basin uh, so that you could, in fact, uh, put your water pitcher under it and sort of collect the water and take it, take it home. As we'll see in a moment, there was an apartment building that had six of these within the apartment building. So it was kind of a condominium. By the way, that is a Roman word, condominium. It means with the common domain, um, an association that provided this infrastructure and paid for it by the residents who owned units uh, in this apartment building. 
This is uh, one of those water fountains, probably the most elaborate one we have, but uh, Pompeii had them on just about every corner, every block. Ostia was um, a port city, and um, so the storage of commodities was very important. These are, you have wheat coming in from North Africa, you have wool coming in from England, wool and tin, you have ivory coming in from uh, India and from up the Nile and Sudan and so forth, and um, these were bought and sold in a commodities market. So what we see here are horea, H-O-R-R-E-A, these horea were warehouses uh, for the storage of commodities, and they looked a bit like this, actually molded brick. Um, these were not finished. They were intended to be seen as brick. Well, who's buying and selling this? The people on the commodities exchange. They had a stock market there, uh, which was, believe it or not, attached to the theater. Now, the form of the Greek theater is retained in the Roman world, but the function changes. It's no longer associated um, the palaestra is no longer associated with the sanctuary of Dionysus, for example. In fact, here it has been converted into a commodities market. Some of you have walked that with me, um, a few of you. Uh, this is actually the theater, and if we look at this, we can see that the, it was separate. You could not view this view that opens up into that commodities exchange would have been blocked at this line that we see right along here with the skene, or the scenery, and then the area in front, the proskene, with the orchestra. You'll also notice that the Roman version of the Greek theater has been flattened, that is, cut into a 180-degree circle uh, to accommodate differing uses for this space, which was originally a sanctuary of a Greek god. Uh, in Pompeii, they were used as the barracks for the gladiators, that so recently, just three years ago, collapsed. Along the commodities market that we see here, in fact, the temple in the center is the temple to Ceres, goddess of grain, cereal, it comes from her. And um, this is actually the logos of the various companies that had seats on the exchange, very much like Wall Street. Just amazing. You could order up two jars of mustard, an elephant, and some wheat, you know. And you're in there putting down bids and marking up prices. And then uh, there's a factotum who is sitting down here from some corporation or guild that is somewhere else, and they are sending messages and saying, you know, there's, we've got a demand for such and such in Spain, and we have a load of something, something coming from Egypt, and uh, that's going to open up so many cubic feet, so much volume, cubic meters. Um, they didn't use feet, meters, but uh, cubic feet of space on this ship that's headed to Spain, and we want to uh, buy at this price, right? V very much like a global uh, exchange would operate today. Adjacent to that was the fireman's barracks. And notice it's located in the district with the warehouses. These were, uh, while they feared fire, and it was important to put fire out everywhere, uh, they were protecting the, um, the warehouses because they were particularly subject to, uh, to fire. Every once in a while you'll hear a story of a grain silo exploding in Iowa or something, right? Um, this is actually, I love the name, the, the Vigili Fuoco, uh, the vigil, the fire vigilantes is what they were. <laughs> and um, they actually rotated in and out and lived here and ate collective meals and so forth as we see in this building. I mentioned the scola or the gills, the uh, Collegio. Collegial is a college is a Roman word. It means simply that you are part of an organization that has colleagues. That's what it actually means. So the Senate, in a sense, was a collegio. But it also had a double meaning of the, the, the professional guilds. So but being a port city, we have a lot of shipbuilding guilds here. And this one is the uh, Scola Traiano, and across the street, the Fabria Navales. The Navales, uh, the Naviculares, these were the people who were the shipbuilders, the sailmakers, uh, the naval stores, uh, tar pitch to seal the, um, the wood, and so on and so forth. And uh, you would actually apprentice to this, and, and um, um, the medieval guilds actually were derived from, um, from these, these Roman guilds. They're very powerful. Just outside of the Pomerium, whoops, what happened? 
just outside of the pomerium. Let's go back. Um, we had the Machellum, which we see uh, in the lower part of the image, and then the this covered market that we see for finer silk and stuff like that, stuff that would be imported across the Silk Road from Asia and would be brought in here. Adjacent to that, interestingly enough, was a Mithraeum. Um, I just love the density of this. And when I talk about boundaries intramural, this is what I'm talking about. Party walls, the subdivision of territory, uh, these boundaries which are shared between and among various uses, including by the 4th century A.D., a Christian church, although there's some controversy about its use, that we see here, adjacent to a Mithraeum, which was actually embedded within a covered shopping mall. All of these, Mithras being a Persian deity, and then this across from the meat market, this temple and fountain, which was dedicated just outside the Pomerium and the west gate of the Pomerium along the Decumanus, uh, to a Roman deity that is unknown, never been identified. Retail was distributed very much like it would be today in a city, uh, along the major streets, uh, along the major, um, um, the Decumanus in this case, the Cardo, and then we see the market buildings and so forth. Along the Via Abundanza in Pompeii, showing the land use along that, number one being the Stabian Baths, uh, this sort of reconstruction drawing that we see of these buildings, this is, you're actually standing right here looking, you're looking uh, from this point right here in this direction. This building that you see, this writing that you see right here is actually on this wall right here. So you're looking in this direction. That overhang is supposedly that overhang which was reconstructed. Along that street, you would have Taberna, stores, taverns. The taberna, this was a thermopolium, this particular one, uh, which meant you could get hot and cold drinks. And so there was a device where you would lower uh, these terracotta pots down into uh, a cavity, and that cavity then could insulate against uh, something cold, losing its coldness, or something hot, losing its heat. Food to go, sandwiches, a lot of fish sandwiches type, type stuff, bread, and there you see one of those public drinking fountains just outside. This raises an interesting question, which is a bit of a sidebar, won't be on the test, uh, which has to do with Roman literacy. But we have a question in the back, and I will come back to the question of Roman literacy in a moment. No zoning. No zoning. It was all a natural process. But remember, there's no zoning in the United States until 1926. So this part of town when it was built, had no zoning. Downtown, when it was built, had no zoning, right? Um, this raises an interesting question about literacy in the Roman world. There's a guy who teaches at Harvard named Harris who uh, wrote a book about 10 years ago, sort of big, thick scholarly text, which I could not make my way completely through. Um, and he estimated this that literacy was at about 18%. There are over a thousand inscriptions that have been uncovered at Pompeii alone, and only about half of Pompeii has actually been uh, excavated. I think that um, it was much, much higher. I would say uh, even as high as 40 to 50 percent. The um, I'm not being romantic about this uh, because I think the nature of some of these inscriptions, some of which are written in broken Latin would indicate a degree of functional literacy um, uh, that was much higher than the 18% that Harris states. And I'll give you a couple of examples of why I think so. The first is, it's a fascinating question. It's one we don't know. We still don't know. Um, we know that it declined precipitously in the Middle Ages so that many, many kings, for example, could not read or write. Um, well, First, you have to define what you mean by literacy, right? How many of you have heard of the expression, to be or not to be? That is the question. Raise your hands. Yeah. How many of you know who wrote it? Right? Shakespeare. Uh, do you know what play it's from? Okay, we're down to two people, three people. 
four people, five people, six people. Uh, can you give me the whole quote? That is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them. That does not mean I've read Hamlet. You follow me? You follow me? All right. So if you find uh, an inscription from Virgil somewhere, it doesn't mean they've read the Aeneid, right? So, it, it, But functional literacy, and I go here back to Ostia, how do you have this vast degree that rivals, which will not occur anywhere in the world again until the 19th and 20th centuries, do you have uh, the commodities market, for example, uh, all these stores and shops and people buying and selling, if you can't functionally read and write, add numbers, keep ledger books, place orders, do all these things, right? That combined with, as I mentioned, all sorts of little poems and things which are written in sort of strange, broken Latin, which would indicate maybe that somebody's native language was not Latin, but they were from somewhere else living there, um, which, uh, some of which are even scrawled on the walls of the brothel in Pompeii, uh, would indicate to me that, that functional literacy was, was very high. Second, um, at a place called Oxyrinthos in Egypt, uh, which disappeared because the, a branch of the Nile silted up and shifted, dried up, people moved, sand blew, covered it over, uh, doesn't exist anymore. But uh, a catch, because there's, it's very dry, it's in the desert, um, organic material has a tendency to remain for a long time. So a cache of, 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 of writings, uh, some of which are these kind of weird gospels that have gotten a lot of attention, like the Gospel of Thomas, the Nag Hammadi, a site called Nag Hammadi. Well, at Oxyrinthos, this tiny little town on a branch of the Nile, um, there's a partial Roman census from the year 240 CE, um, actually recovered. It's only about 36 households. But of those 36 households, all but five had one person in the house who could read and write and fill out the form. That's an astonishing 84%. Do I believe that all these people living somewhere on the fringes, uh, somewhere in Britannia, up on the fringes of Scotland, could read and write? No. But I would say overall, you have a much higher uh, level of literacy in the Roman world than, than Harris believes, and much higher than we think. It's a fascinating question, but again, I just wanted to, it's a sidebar, but um, probably going to prevent me from getting through the material at hand, but I thought I would share that with you. Housing is of two types, uh, simple to remember. The domus, home, single family house, had a party wall, um, and then the second type is the insula, the apartment building. The, uh, before the Hellenistic period, uh, this would have been the Roman house that we see right here. And then, interestingly enough, after uh, the sort of Greek world comes within the Roman sphere, and we have this kind of Greco-Roman civilization emerging, we begin to get in Rome, in Italy, and all the way to England, for that matter, uh, we begin to get this second sort of attachment that we see back here, which is called a peristyle. Now, a lot of the names, if we go to the House of the Fawn at Pompeii, we will see um, a certain names attached to these things with Greek writing and other things, which would indicate that this was a Greek um, importation. But as I said earlier, um, there is no Hellenic period Greek house that I know of ever excavated in the Greek world that had a planted courtyard. But all of these were planted as gardens, pools, fountains, had cisterns underneath as water supply. And the most important was this room, number 13, which was the triclinium or the dining room. The dining room was, in effect, the most important room that opened into the living room of the Roman house, which was outdoors. Okay? All the rooms open to the interior. When that begins to occur around the 2nd, 1st century BCE, uh, we begin to get a shift, and number five becomes the office of the pater familias, the head of the household. And the clients uh, would come, your clientela would come to you 
during business hours. And business would be constructed here. Um, and this is the view from the um, tablinum, uh, the office of the paterfamilias looking out to the street. Um, these were fascinating, and often because of this long sort of corridor that you see leading into this atrium, this is called four is an atrium, 12 is a, um, is a uh, peristyle. The, um, you could have retail uh, that opened shops that opened out to the street. And sometimes you'll see back doors that indicated that they had a side business going and perhaps one of their servants or something was running the taberna or the thermopolia that was out on facing out onto the street. The view in the house of the Veti, the Veti, a fascinating house. They were uh, born slaves, and they uh, were manumitted in their early 20s, two brothers. Uh, as far as we can tell, they never married, um, and they became fabulously wealthy in the import-export business in Pompeii. Uh, this is the view from their dining room, looking out then into the peristyle uh, that we see here. The insula, the uh, apartment building, carried the same name as the Roman block. The block was called the insula. And um, about 90% of what we know about Roman apartment buildings come from Ostia. Uh, there aren't really any left anywhere in Rome. They were either knocked down, torn down, covered over, converted into some other use. Because Ostia was abandoned, and the harbor silted over, and eventually the whole city was covered with sand and mud. Uh, it simply awaited excavation in the 20th century. So we have uh, good examples of apartment buildings here. But this is where how this is the type of building 90% of the residents of Rome would have lived in apartment buildings. For example, if you went to New York today, you would not see people living in Manhattan in single-family houses, right? I mean, it doesn't happen. You wouldn't have had that um, uh, in Rome either. Only in Pompeii, this little town down, um, down on about 20,000 people down on the, it's like Naples, Florida or something, right? So we don't want to just take, you couldn't, from excavating Naples, Florida, you would never arrive at Chicago. You follow me? You, you can't get there from here. Um, they're not equivalent. But, um, but the, the insula, yes? Well, an insula was not for someone, but like today, if you had enough money, um, conceivably you could you could buy a building in Manhattan, tear it down. If you could pay forty million dollars for the land and you know build yourself a single-family house, um, so they were not um, set aside for that. And some of these apartment buildings, as we'll see here in a moment, were really quite luxurious, and for what we might call the professional class or the upper middle class, you know, people like me. Um, not wealthy, but comfortable. Okay. Um, this is an example. This is the Casa de Diana, the House of Diana. And um, I'll try to run through this quickly. It's sort of self-explanatory. You had uh, ground floor retail, a courtyard in the center, a hall that went around that that distributed people into various apartments, and then external stairs that came down on the street. The facade looked like this. These buildings were about four to five stories. And um, they were quite elaborate in some cases. This is a reconstruction drawing of the Casa di Dipinti at Ostia, some of which had ground floor restaurants. This is one that we see in the upper right in the so-called house of the bar, complete with a place to sit while you were waiting for a table or waiting on food to go, the little counter that we see out here opening out onto the street. This is a reconstruction by Gismondi. And then here we see uh, the one on the left, number one, this very elaborate garden apartment that we see where you had six fountains serving as water supply, um, probably owned by the people who lived in this domus here, with entrances into this courtyard and then four-story buildings in the center with mirrored images uh, of apartment buildings, very nice apartment buildings. I think this would be just fine over here in Midtown somewhere today. And then religion. You'll notice here that uh, green is Mithraic. This is from about the second to third centuries CE, uh, this religion that came in from Persia, um, open only to men. 
Uh, you'll see temples to Isis, for example, which was open only to women. Uh, red is Christian, and blue is Jewish. Now, if you map that relative to the Roman temples, you will notice what? A pattern where the Roman temples are either clustered around the forum, at the gates of the city, or at some other very significant place relative to this public constitutional frame. And I think this emphasizes uh, what I was referring to earlier, that the Roman religion was a religion of state. Uh, you could be both. You could salute the high gods like you'd salute the flag, but you could still be Jewish or you could be Islamic or you could be Christian or you could be a Zen Buddhist or whatever because you had dual identity. And then finally, the necropolis that we see here outside the uh, boundary of the city. And my last slide, we will then, um, on Wednesday, we will go back to Rome because while all of this is going on over a several hundred year period, Rome has grown to a city of 1.3 million people. It is by far the largest city in the ancient world, and we will then take a look at some of the imperial buildings uh, and how some of this infrastructure and public building impacted the city of Rome, concluding with its fragmentation into a thousand pieces with the moving of the capital of the Roman world to what is now Turkey. Okay? Any further questions? Okay.